Good evening, everyone. Um, it, it's uh, without a doubt a great pleasure to, to have Dana um, uh, lecturing tonight. She's, you know, um, such an esteemed colleague and a, and a very, very good friend of me and, and everyone in this room. And um, even though we uh, we know that we'll support and query with, uh, I think, elegance and intelligence. You, like all of us, when we lecture in front of our hometown crowd, we always feel a little bit nervous. And um, that was a, a nice moment of talking about that, I think. It means we, uh, we want to impress. Um, she is really one of UCLA's great assets, and uh, I, I speak for all of us, um, you know, in the community when I say how much an honor and a pleasure it is to teach and engage with Dana in, um, in as we pursue new forms of thought, which is what we, we do here. To be interested in the phenomena of urbanism in the city would seem natural for anyone who in fact lives in a city. As we do here in Los Angeles, the city is a place in which we gather and agree to share and engage in formal and informal economies in the hopes that the benefits to such close physical proximity outweigh the costs associated with such an enterprise. For most, though, the city is simply there. It's like an infrastructure to move through a substrate that supports our more conscious efforts at living. While we may love and cherish our city and even give back to it, we also ruthlessly exploit its resources, and which I here do not necessarily mean physical resources, although that can be exploited as well. Here I'm talking about conceptual ones. By definition, then, we are all interested in the city because we participate in its relentless evolutionary process to find its logical form. But even to talk about the form of the city is to move away from simply living inside it, using its power for work or its scenography for entertainment. Indeed, thinking about the form of the city is not done by people who are merely interested in the urban, but only by those who dare to inhabit it as a true mystery rather than simply as a place to live. Like lots of strange things, but certainly is probably one of the largest, the city is indisputably unknowable. Yes, there are metrics, graphs, atlases, charts, etc. that we can refer to in data sets that can both be quantitatively analyzed or interpreted, but the city inevitably escapes description, and because of this, it certainly escapes understanding. I suppose that if a city could be completely understood, it might not be worth living in because, as in the case with Los Angeles, being a part of an unsolved urban mystery sounds way better than being in one that's been figured out. Tonight's speaker, Dana Cuff, has been on this case, the case of architecture in the city, for a very long and very intense period of time. Only the most persistent, curious, and perceptive minds can take on the task of not simply trying to figure out how cities work, and what makes them such a strange organism and how they tick, but more importantly, to reread, rethink, and even recreate the city for us. Because if we can't really know it, then we should be able to freely imagine it any way we want. Dana's work on the city is profound in the sense that it, while it uncovers real evidence, it is the lens through which she reads it that is so original. And one of those lenses is the ability to navigate urban shifts from the large, which she has previously called, for instance, convulsive moments, to very small, as in her work on backyard homes. Another lens comes in the form of the idea, at least for me, of uh, Jorge Luis Borges' concept of the Aleph, a point at which all other points are contained. Both City Lab and the Urban Humanities Institute are structures that operate at the point of the Aleph, where politics, form, program, art, economics, and literature all play a part in the production of new ideas of urbanism, all working together to shape a moment in the city, whether spectacular or quotidian. While Dana is one of the world's foremost scholars and authorities of the problem of the city, she is, in my estimation, 
a unique urban strategist, one working beyond the realm of the provocateur, of which she is also that too, but is in the change her work brings both materially to the city and to our perception of what a city is and how it means to live in it that makes her work so significant and so unavoidably relevant. In terms of the reportage and investigation of the urban mystery, I know of no one else who operates across scales, across locations and situations with such precision of thought and persuasiveness of argument. Dana's critical acumen is only exceeded by her ability to invent scenarios of momentary urban form through media and design. She does not hold up a mirror to the world to describe its perfect reflection back to us. She uses these lenses to distort, refract, and reflect a new condition each time she peers through them. It's a, I would say, beautiful and complex world that she presents to us. Please uh, welcome Dana Kopp. So much. Well, uh, tonight I'm going to step outside the convention of architectural scholarship and a little bit outside of architectural lectures and talk point blank about politics and in particular about architectural agency. And I apologize to everyone because I think today was the first day we woke up and there was some news about dropping the card and getting the moonlight. Um, was actually the winner. We didn't have to read Trump as our first message today, so uh, I'm sorry to bring that back into our discourse. If you've had one day of rest, I've just spoiled it. We find ourselves in a viscerally changed political universe, which gives us a chance to look at the various ways architecture and architects can act with relevant and effective strategies. To start this, I think I have to share my own position in this discussion. Though I was trained in art and design, I hold a PhD and so am an architectural academic. Academics have practices, according to the social philosopher Pierre Bourdieu. Primarily, these are research, writing books and articles, and giving lectures, like tonight. From the very start, however, I muddled the water a bit by deploying my scholarly practices to study the practices of architects and, to some extent, the practices of architectural educators. My first body of research resulted in a book about the architectural profession. For a year of anthropological fieldwork in architectural offices, I examined the interpersonal politics between architects and clients. I concluded that design was a form of negotiation expressed in drawings, models, conversation, and occasionally decisions. An architectural team and a client group, for example, met to discuss their shared project over long periods of time. And these meetings guided the design's evolution, but not through direct decision making, as I had initially assumed. Power relations persuasive skills, resistance, control of purse strings, these political machinations and more were always at play. Since I was academically based, it struck me that we might do more to train students in these forms of politics, the politics found in architectural offices and that play a role in form making. That led to a second body of work, another scholarly output of book, Expanding from interpersonal negotiations around design, I looked at the interactions between architects and the public, moving to larger scale politics of housing, community, city agencies, and elected officials, all the while searching for moments within the process where design occurred, and by inference, the points of leverage where architecture is effective in political contexts. LA's public housing, for example, was deeply politicized but the city authority hired talented, ideologically committed architects 
who worked with astute design and political intermediaries, proto-clients of a sort, to create strong projects, even with tight budgets, strict regulations, great controversy. That is until the whole public housing program collapsed, as I'll describe in a little bit. The third body of work, another long-term effort, produced a research and design center called CityLab, to which Neil referred. Um, as you may know, CityLab is celebrating its 10th anniversary now at the A plus D Museum. Founded with my colleague Roger Sherman, CityLab has collaborated with Neil Denari, uh, Kevin Daly, Martin Nowak, Jason Payne, Duvan Chozel, just to name our colleagues in the architecture department along with dozens of students. So if the first body of research was an academic study looking in on the politics of the architectural office, the second project was an academic study looking in on the politics of the architecture profession and its urban projects. This third effort, ongoing, City Lab, is for an academic like myself a more radical restructuring of research into a kind of design practice. Now, rather than an ethics study, or a study from the outside looking in, City Lab represents an experiential body of research, an emic study from within. As well as producing a set of research and design projects, say into densifying LA, the single family uh, residential fabric in particular, City Lab is also a means of testing ideas about the politics of art through projects. So let me give you an example. After almost a decade of projects about backyard homes, we understood not only the architectural issues related to material fabrication, available sites, and so on, we also knew the political landscape and what citizens resisted or desired in different communities. All this background led to my ability to co-author the new state accessory dwelling ordinance that Governor Brown just signed into law. City Lab, therefore, is contaminated from a scholarly perspective. It draws conclusions not just about what is, but how things ought to be. My work in City Lab can be, and has been, accused of being practically minded. So the fourth and most recent undertaking pushes back into academic structures to see if more conventional arenas of academic practices, like the humanities, and our more projective practices from architecture could create the means for the university to be more socially and politically engaged. The evolving result of this work is the Urban Humanities Initiative, a new type of academic program that a lot of the people here in the audience are involved with. Um, in other words, it's a kind of experiment into the university's practices. Our starting point for collective restructuring of the university is the city. Because it is not only inherently in need of multiple forms of scholarship, but because it's intrinsically political. The urban humanities holds commitments not only to historical understanding and contemporary cultural analysis, but to a speculative agenda, the architectural determination to project a better future. Okay, well, that was kind of a long way of laying my own positionality there. I still have one caveat, and that is that these lines of inquiry hold implications about whether we can open new possible paths for architectural research uh, and architectural practice and education. These are not, I'm not suggesting these are the only paths. I'm not trying to tell anyone what they ought to do. There are existing forms of practice, education, and research say, into architectural materials, history and theory, and technology that are well worth undertaking and should remain so. And I'm not challenging them. I'm only suggesting that we augment them. I'm taking this up with you now because we need political relevance more than ever. Uh, a number of students have come to me and have expressed with all of us this new uh, pressure to extend some political relevance into our own teaching. If there are paths that architectural education, research, and practice can chart, we should find them sooner rather than later. Look, for instance, at what our professional organization is doing if you need to be convinced. The AIA, on the day after Trump's election, issued this statement. 
KIA and its 89,000 members are committed to working with President-elect Trump to address the issues our country faces, particularly strengthening the nation's aging infrastructure. As you probably know, this caused an outcry uh, found under the banner hashtag NotMyAIA. Hundreds of posts were let loose, editorials and articles challenging the AIA's promise to cooperate with the new administration. Michael Zorkin, ever Florin Penn, wrote this. Architects and other designers working in the built environment have special insight into both the mentality and the behavior of Donald Trump, who has gained his fortune as a builder, developer, and brander of architecture. Trump's well-documented history of racial discrimination, tenant harassment, stiffing creditors, including architects, evasive bankruptcies, predilection for projects of low social value, such as casinos, and his calculated evasion of the taxes that might support our common realm, are of a piece with his larger nativist, sexist, and racist political project. I think that was one sentence. We do not welcome Trump to the White House. The AIA leadership issued two apologies, one for each guy, but never overcame the problem. We see part of their inadequate response here. Unfortunately, the statement I issued, this is from Robert Ivey, after the election results came in was toned down. It did not reflect our larger values. And then from Davidson, the AIA remains bipartisan and committed to our values. We will continue to be at the table and be a voice for the profession, especially when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We will advocate vigorously for our sustainability agenda, including the impacts of climate change. And we will work hard to bring funding to help rebuild our communities all around the country. Can academia, can contemporary criticism help these two guys find their way out of this poor showing? For example, how does an organization like the AIA hold true to its values, self-stated diversity or sustainability, in the face of a political regime that opposes those values and still imagine that it might remain bipartisan? Moving back across the research practice boundary, we academics have been rather silent about architecture's direct and contemporary relationship with national politics. Museums and exhibitions have played a role in current issues perhaps more effectively and have blended practices of academics and practitioners. Reinhold Martin's investigations shown here into the 2008 housing collapse were deeply interested in politics and particular political economies as well as design experimentation. The foreclosed show was itself a theory practice undertaking with primary emphasis on the projective practices sponsored by the MoMA show. A somewhat strange book set the exhibition in motion, one that employed an imagined conversation with Socrates intended to spark thinking about contemporary notions of the public entitlement and the housing economy. Since books and journal articles are the production of architectural scholars, there are fine historical examinations of the relationship between architecture architectural education, and politics. These are just two of the more recent. These are analytic, theoretically robust, interpretive texts that are neither contemporary, uh, they look back, not at the present, nor do they pretend to be speculative. They don't suggest what we should do as a result of the research. They are excellent works of academically construed history. But what if we need and want to understand an administration now, Trump today, not to wait for the 20-year hindsight we need? Can we grasp the implications of the present political moment? This image is interesting to me, not in terms of Trump's personal psychology, ego, neuroses, or megalomaniacal tendencies, though obviously these all play a role in his presidency. Instead, this tableau vivant of developer King and his dominion is a material culture, a book-free universe of glittering simulacra isolated above the rest of the world. As we shall see, even our architectural critics today 
at least those in the popular media, are struggling to find avenues into this slippery, developer-defined presidency. Can architectures, critics, educators, students, professionals, and scholars help locate the avenues for resistance, opposition, and action, and if so, how? This is part of the question of our potential agency, both to understand and to act according to the values that may not be part of this new regime. We need not ask about bipartisanship. We want to know what we can do. What can we, how can we claim the particular agency that architecture affords? To locate a work of architectural scholarship about its co-temporaneous administration, we could turn to Mary McLeod's seminal essay called Architecture and Politics in the Reagan Era. It was written in 1989, the last year of Reagan's presidency, so she still had eight years more perspective than we have. It was published in Assemblage and subsequently featured in a number of theory collections. In terms of scholarship around political economy and the arts, one of the strongest voices at that time was Fred Jameson's 1991 Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. Written from within that same Reagan era, Jameson describes his theorizing of postmodernism as, and I quote, the effort to take the temperature of the age without instruments and in a situation in which we are not even sure there is so coherent a thing as an age or a zeitgeist or a current situation any longer. We too are without instruments and identifiable situations, but we can look into the past, in this case the recent past, to see how postmodernism set a larger context for late capitalism and Reagan, as well as the roots of the current neoliberal economy. Graves Portland Building is sometimes called the first major postmodern work of architecture. It could be a demonstration of McLeod's argument that under postmodernist circumstances that include the rejection of modernism's failed social agenda, architecture remains stubbornly tied to politics in two ways. First, in its role in the economy, and second, in its role as a cultural object. In the first case, architecture, simply because of its extreme cost, is more deeply affected than other arts by market pressures and is dependent on the sources of finance and power in every aspect of its production and in every step of design practice. The choice of site, program, budget, materials, and production schedules. This limits what McLeod calls architecture's quote, transgressive and transformative power. Gray's design was marketable, somewhat transformative, and Portland bought it. In terms of the second case, that is, architecture's cultural role, designers like Venturi Scott Brown and Charles Moore represented the discipline's populist agenda. Charles Jenks noting that works like Venturi Scott Brown's Freedom Plaza here embodied a kind of double coding. Lay people could enjoy it, while we in the architectural intelligentsia could ascribe it critical acclaim. Because of the economic downturn of the 1970s, architects were almost entirely out of work. They returned to a discourse of architecture as art and its communicative power as cultural object. But perhaps there's something already not just ironic, but slightly disingenuous in an architecture that is about architecture, a quotation of the city itself. In this case, L'Enfant's 1791 plan for Washington, D.C., with the nearby actual mall represented in miniature graphs. Since the early 70s, it was widely accepted that modernism had failed in both its social agenda most obviously in public housing failures, and its formal agenda through the destruction of city centers through urban renewal. 
The AT&T building seemed less double-coded than thumbing its nose, while its architect, once an admirer of Hitler and acolyte of Albert Speer, seems less populist and more celebrity, more media star, as McLeod says. Reading this rendering of the architect holding his tower suggests not only the celebrity designer, but that the building belongs to him, a privatization of the cultural role of architecture that was previously seen as a public good or as belonging to the city. The economic downturn exaggerated this privatization, pushing developers into the limelight, giving them new control of city building. City building that didn't even require real capital, but global investments of fictional capital. Here, young Trump leans on Johnson's AT&T, calmly advancing his own tower, what we might now view as his private competition to dominate or own New York's urban stage. The privatization of the public sphere, which began in earnest under Reagan, only gained steam in the following decades. By the 90s, Trump hired Johnson to reclad his new international hotel and tower at Columbus Circle. The New York Times architecture critic, the late Herbert Mouchamp, wrote a negative review of the building in 1995, but readers complained it wasn't scathing enough. So he wrote a second review seems to call out second tries out of many people. Um, in Mushamp's second review, he ropes us in, us the public, by saying, this building is us in the process of commercial transformation. It shows what the Midas touch can do to a city's soul. This process didn't stop in New York, as we know. Trump would go on to make more thinly kitschy gilt towers like this one in Las Vegas. In 1999, something like four years after Mouchamp's last, last communication with Trump, Mouchamp wanted to know more about this Midas and staged a meeting between himself, Johnson, and Trump at MoMA in front of Andy Warhol's Maryland painting which Philip Johnson himself had donated to the museum. After that meeting, in a long, incisive, yet still somehow ambivalent essay, Mouchamp wrote, Trump has attained the status of a popular icon set against the gold of celebrity. He's a work of art himself, as well as a piece of work. A living self-portrait with a trademark signature sought by foreign banks, condo dwellers, autograph hounds, advertisers, and publishers. Warhol's dream was to live off putting his signature on soup cans. Mr. Trump has more or less fulfilled it. I miss Mitchell. With the privatization and the concentration of wealth comes celebrity, not just for actresses like Marilyn Monroe, but young city builders like Donald Trump. Uh, what changed since Mushamp's article, though, even then crowds were calling out for Trump to run for the presidency, is that the potent cocktail of celebrity, populism, brand identity, and wealth just added an immense shot of state power, all concentrated in the current administration. It's too frightening and too easy to see this same mixture of celebrity, wealth, and populism in Nazi Germany. You don't know how many Nazi Germany slides I took out of this talk, so I apologize that I couldn't jettison them all. But if we just focus on the arts and architecture of the 1930s fascism under Hitler, we see a clear deployment of monumental architecture as propaganda in the architect Truss House of German Art, including a Midas gold model made for Hitler's 50th birthday. The art it displayed was state-sanctioned, traditional, ideal art, in contrast to what was called the degenerate art of the modernists. Uh, let me see if I can stage it. Radical politics flourished. The
we stopped. Architects, as we know firsthand from the architectural emigres who fled Germany to Los Angeles, did not escape government attack, nor did architectural education, in spite of the fact that when Mies took over as director of the Bauhaus, he tried to distance himself, the work, and the school from all ideology, as if a pure architecture might slip under Nazi radar. Under Mies, who became director in 1930, architectural studies no, dominated no. the Bauhaus and all political activity was banned. To no avail. In Dessau, as earlier in Weimar, the Nazis gained control of the city council and closed what they saw as a festering sewer of communist, cosmopolitan, and Jewish ideas. So in spite of Mises' careful distancing himself from the Hannes Meyer regimes and other uh, ideologically driven work, the Bauhaus loomed large in the German imagination in the 30s. But that was at least in part intentionally constructed by Nazi propaganda. A symbolic slaying of the arts in America is being proposed in the next federal budget to be announced in March. This graphic is kind of humorous, if word so sad, from the Washington Post shows the tiny, in fact, invisible sliver of the federal spending pie represented by eliminating the arts, humanities, and public broadcasting together. There is a tiny line down from that arrow. I could put it differently. If we think of America as making $50,000 a year, cutting the arts saves about two bucks. In the totalizing ideology that spending, or better, investing, denotes value, no matter how emaciated the arts might be, they're worth eliminating, under the argument that public funding of the arts is not necessary when private speculators can supply what's needed. More incisive is the statement by Thomas Campbell, director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, last week. He said, quote, eliminating the National Endowment for the Arts would in essence eliminate investment by the American government in the curiosity and intelligence of its citizens. Besides the control of artistic production, okay, and I also have a lot of Mussolini, who's also only a little bit here. Um, besides the control of artistic production, repressive state power commonly deploys architecture in one further manner, through the production of infrastructure. Hence, the justifiable backlash against the AIA's eagerness to help with the upcoming infrastructure projects. Infrastructure repair may create little collateral damage, as when a bridge is strengthened or a road repaved. Typically, these are not the architectural undertakings at all, but ones of civil or structural engineering. <coughs> Nevertheless, our antenna should be tuned in to all the infrastructure proposals since infrastructure contains potential power in its network-like reach and its intrinsically public nature. In Italy in the 20s and 30s, M Mussolini swung what he called, quote, his majesty the pick, to idealize the common working man, to create open spaces around the most Italian of Rome's imperial monuments, and to carve connections that made legible, as well as defensible, the connections between church and state. Demolition of the old, the value of hard labor, the strength of a single man to clear the way for progress, all these were presented and in fact mediated for public consumption. Here we see Mussolini on the right uh, clearing the Via della Conciliazione in 1937. Il Duce's infrastructural works to create Rome as a, quote, giant palace of fascism, foretold the economist Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction, a term he coined in 1942. If Mussolini recognized the necessity of destruction for political repression and the legitimation of state authority, the next political e economic version of major civic demolition would add this other purpose, free market progress or Schumpeter's creative destruction. Lest we imagine this kind of destruction only occurred abroad, similar immense infrastructural projects were undertaken in pre- and post-war America. 
starting with FDR's New Deal in the 1930s, all the way through Eisenhower's Federal Highway Program. And here you're looking at Los Angeles. Now, the U.S. border wall is the infrastructural solution to a security threat, a threat with no data to back up its claims. A parallel national defense infrastructure in the 40s and 50s was the highway program. Sold as a security network, highway construction did untold damage to poor neighborhoods of color in American cities. A form of domestic colonialism, highways met what was called the equivalent elimination requirement. So that when the government constructed new housing, say as in the case of the public housing program, this regulation required the removal of a unit of existing housing for every new unit built. This rule, a contradictory one, obviously, if what we're trying to do is provide housing, came from lobbying by the building industry, who wanted no competition in the supply of housing, and it effectively tore apart poor neighborhoods and cities across the U.S. at the same time, hastening the deterioration of the remaining housing in the marketplace of creative destruction. In Los Angeles, as elsewhere, freeway construction accomplished several goals at the same time. It displaced an unwanted population, <coughs> set the stage to modernize the city, created construction jobs, and provided public funds for privatizing downtown in the form of investment potential. It was under progressive leadership, though, not fascist, that America began its public housing program. It was a form of architectural infrastructure, post-depression housing for a destabilized working class. Thousands of families whose homes were demolished to provide the sites for public housing were to be rehoused in the new modern apartments. But as the country entered the war, those displaced households were displaced a second time, this time by defense workers who took priority. Lloyd Wright, Sam Frank Lloyd Wright, and Richard Neutra, among other noted architects, designed projects uh, for the Public Housing Authority that laid out progressive ideals for everyday life. The developments embodied remarkable site planning and livable unit plans, even if they were so massive in scale and so uniform. We shouldn't forget, however, that Levittown was blanketing Long Island at just this same time without any of the same political backlash. The backlash against public housing from the far right was extreme and was part of Joseph McCarthy's red baiting propaganda. Builders, especially residential developers, testified against government housing as socialist communist poison. They argued successfully to rid the city of any further subsidized housing so that private builders could control the market. While no Los Angeles architects were jailed, some of their clients, in particular public housing activists like Frank Wilkinson, were tried and imprisoned. The American public housing program, relatively speaking, was tiny. We built about a million units, the same number as Sweden, a country whose entire population is smaller than that of Los Angeles. But as I stated earlier, <coughs> even now public housing is lumped together with urban renewal as representing, or to some, causing the failure of modern architecture. Instead, history should suggest that public housing was a victim of right-wing propaganda marshaled by private developers, a political force that's grown in strength until this day. It's an understatement to say that the development industry has morphed considerably since residential builders fought government construction of housing Commanding global flows of investment capital, Trump's <coughs> multifarious and nefarious organizations provide the material artifacts of a contemporary future, a worldwide proliferation of towers that are corporate, shell-owned, brand-licensed, fueled by questionable multi-bank lending deals, and capable of shedding both their financing and their identity at any moment. Architecture here is a carrier of the logo, a skin of gold, an extrusion of real estate. Still, as Mushaf realized in the 90s, architecture matters, and perhaps even more so, architectural criticism matters. In 2014, Blair Kamen of the Chicago Tribune, 
uh, he's their architecture critic, commended Trump for his Chicago Skidmore Owings and Merrill skyscraper. But a second article slammed him for the gigantic sign he put on top, calling it humongous and hideous. Seems like he was using the same vocabulary <laughs> as Trump. Trump tweeted back, I love the day Paul Goldberger got fired or left as the New York Times architecture critic and has since faded into irrelevance. Came in next. So perhaps the first direct form of agency goes to architectural journalists whose criticism strikes a Twitter nerve, a nerve that now regulates the pulse of our news each morning and possibly U.S. foreign relations. The journalist's agency is in the ability to act according to our values, and that act places architecture in the public conversation. It's important to recognize that the agency remains, even if it doesn't alter the Trump Organization's branding strategy. <coughs> Another kind of agency comes in the form of architectural and urban regulation. A range of architectural possibilities are unleashed through policy, which we architects can engage more fully. Defeating Measure S in Los Angeles, for example, is a form of agency for architects who want to see more housing and more transit-related density in the city. Trump Tower in Manhattan, shown here, exploits New York's 1961 POPs law, or privately owned public space regulation. He traded a six-story shopping atrium for a massive density bonus that added 20 stories more of luxury condominiums. That allowed almost 50% more FAR to what would end up being a 66-story building. It's within our agency to reduce such bargains. Is that worth a six-story shopping mall? And is that the kind of public space we want to see in the city? We can also enforce these bargains. Just a year after the building opened, Trump illegally denied access and removed public amenities. He was fined, but the case remains open. When he illegally took over the public space to build more shops, like the little Trump store you see there, he did it without building permits. All architects know that seemingly minute <coughs> regulatory infractions can operate like a thousand small cuts. The public and the city can and should hold developers accountable on minor as well as major transgressions. And since political activity must be permitted in privately owned public spaces, a number of Trump's own buildings, both inside and out, provide good backdrops for raising a variety of issues, from misogyny to an open and accessible public sphere. There's already political activity in the form of policing at architectural sites of the present administration. I go back to the initial question. What does it mean to have architectural agency as a student, academic, or professional in a political climate that seems to dismiss our collective ideals of good work and yet demand either compliance or resistance? Is there space for architectural experimentation that produces alternative futures outside those that a repressive regime is creating. Since we have no hindsight on the present administration, we must get our broad if inadequate lessons from the past. There are architectural and urban les lessons for the fashion. Is now. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I was talking about the lessons from history. Um, <laughs> those architectural and urban lessons from fascism, yeah, on the one hand, don't make anything gold. Uh, question the destruction that precedes construction. We should be aware that architects cannot step outside politics and there's no neutral territory. Likewise, schools are not exempt. And here again, being apolitical doesn't save us. There is no abstract neutrality in the arts or architecture. And on the final hand, get out of the country before it's too late. 
Unlike the eras of modernism or the Reagan years when postmodernism predominated, presently there's no unifying school of thought or dominant architectural discourse that might serve as a measure of political and economic pressure. In those earlier periods, architecture itself had some baseline from which compliance or transgression could deviate. In light of our current expansive notion of our discipline, it seems incumbent upon me to risk crafting a tentative baseline. And so I will next outline five principles for our agency. These are historically specific, that is, for and of this moment, not timeless, as Ruskin intended his seven lamps of architecture, or Le Corbusier, his five points of modern architecture. Given the present circumstances, these are inherently inadequate, which is no reason not to offer them, and no reason not to act on them. So, the first principle. Within an architectural project, the program privileges a public sphere. The key terms here are public and program. An architecture that resists repressive political programs is intrinsically public in the sense of accessible, shared in common, and free. Both privately and publicly commissioned projects stress efficiency and security, so it remains the architect's responsibility to find creative means to incorporate a public sphere and the architectural critic's task to elevate it and evaluate it. Infrastructure is one of the most public types of work we can undertake, but its program is often fraught by political and potentially violent outcomes, like displacement, demolition, and segregation. The destruction that comes without, with making a border wall or a new dam spillway will make determinations about what is not worth saving, and these are political determinations. Infrastructure, as well as community rebuilding, as stated in the AIA leader's promise, cannot be advocated in an offhand manner. Because these are significant types of works, we approach them with critical attention, starting by examining what falls under the euphemism of creative destruction. Second, in American cities today, our building type is affordable housing, our broadest goals are environmental. Working broadly for shared public goods, the broadest of which is global environmental sustainability, and with underrepresented populations and those explicitly excluded is an important kind of agency in architecture. It may seem unduly prescriptive to single out housing and environmentalism, but these are presently the most obvious and direct realms for architects to act according to principles of the discipline. So many, uh, so many populations are excluded or demeaned by the current administration that plenty of projects will qualify as standing in opposition, from mosques and embassies to public bathrooms. Some of our work on such projects will be pro bono, some will be slipped in discreetly with more mainstream work, some will be built, some will be conceptual, some may require actual defiance. In the face of propaganda, data-driven design makes it clear that facts matter. In a world threatened by alternative facts, which undermine the very substrate of education and of the university, we architects can retrieve our respect for metrics and empirical data. We can continue to develop evidentiary tools and methods. We can find better ways to communicate and explain the relationship between research and design. This is incumbent upon us here at the public university where blended strategies of research, practice, and education can link academic and muse academy and museum to the exigencies of professional practice. Even though the public of public universities has itself bowed to pressures of neoliberalism, it may be that public architecture programs like our own hold particular insight into the ways that research and practice can productively align so that facts matter. Individual projects are linked into long-term <coughs> pursuits. Architectural practices are generally a series of loosely linked projects, 
the goals of which are set in relation to particular clients, sites, and regulatory contexts. If, we, if our own principles are to hold agency, it will be by virtue of the connections we make among projects and the trajectories we set for the work. For practitioners, projects range from standard commissions to consultations, exhibition installations, and conceptual work. Such long-term projects are far less vulnerable to co-optation and more likely to exceed political frameworks that surround any individual commission. Moreover, uh, around multiple projects in site, the coordinated works of a number of individuals can cohere, forming a stronger political base. The fifth and last, the city, not the nation or private property, is our site. And this brings me back to Neil's original introduction. Here again, this may seem prescriptive, but from fascist regimes of the early 20th century to the McCarthy era in the 50s to our present administration, nationalist systems have come to bad ends. The city, on the other hand, is run by people who have and must have connections to their constituents. Mayors and city council members can and often do restore faith in democratic processes and in the fact that elected officials can actually accomplish something in the public interest. In this cosmopolitan moment, architects, educators, critics, and students who find the means to extend their attention to a particular building beyond its property boundaries and into the city uh, it lives within will find themselves in terrain where they have agency. I want to end by saying that our work at City Lab is both a source of these principles for me and a demonstration of our agency in the crisis of this moment. It is by no means sufficient, but it is a part of the path we can clear for architectural action by scholars, students, and practitioners. Thank you. teach with a lot of these same principles in mind. I, I mean, when I look into the audience, I think part of what I'm talking about, is I've learned actually from my colleagues and my students. So I'm not sure I could take this for 10 weeks. Uh, I, I don't think I want to keep mulling over the contemporary political circumstance, but I think finding agency is something that is intrinsic to what we do in our culture. And, and I'm suggesting that there must be many ways by which we could 
follow out something like a data-driven, you know, that's something that we've kind of abandoned. I think even the term methods has kind of escaped us as a goal or a, an instrument in Jameson's term. And I think we have to rethink that problem. I think we have to grapple with methods and data more seriously in the current circumstance. I see all my doctoral students are like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, thank you. It's the most optimistic thing I've heard since 8 November. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm one of those uh, bureaucrats and political scientists who went back to architecture school mid-career because I realized exactly as you said, nations are no longer able to influence positively our lived environment. I lived most of the year in Japan, and since the Fukushima accident, I've noticed that many of the Japanese architects who were becoming increasingly just artists rather than activists have again started to play a much deeper role mm -hmm. in the way society is performed. Do you believe that the current crisis in the US, uh, this Trumpomania can have maybe the same effect on the architectural community? Because you come across as rather optimistic. <laughs> Uh, at least it's the yeah. tone of the lecture that I've got. Uh, Defiant uh, is a tremendous challenge, but do you think something good could come up? Yeah. I mean, some of the Japanese architects are sitting in this room right now, and I also know their political situation is also fraught. Um, but I think it did marshal a lot of response. It's a bit uh, more direct when you have an environmental catastrophe. Not that it's easier or solvable, but um, I think the current situation that we're in is much more similar to prior repressive political regimes than to disaster conditions. And that comes with the threats of propaganda, which were also the case, I think, in Japan at the time. People didn't trust the government's statements about what was going on. Um, but I heard Judith Butler speak a week ago, and she, someone said to her she seemed optimistic, and I think I would say, repeat her response, which is, I want to project optimism, but I don't necessarily feel optimistic at this moment, but I think we have to act with a, a kind of po the possibility that something uh, can be done. Roger. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> you didn't really talk about it, but um, I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to address the fact that the planning profession and the architectural profession seem to have uh, increasingly different politics. Uh -huh. And that, so that to uh, some extent, when we talk about politics, the architectural, what we look at as architects uh, in terms of political agency, we're not necessarily talking alone about the, what the elected officials we're actually doing <coughs> um, kind of a, a certain degree of agency, competing agency, which is being exercised by the planning profession, which, which has long, longer extended <coughs> its relationship um, and partnership with politics, mm -hmm. with elected officials, and yet the, yet the two professions seem to have very different ideas. Uh, it seems to me about what the future of the city is. And I think this issue about, I think the Measure S thing, I want to make it about Measure S, I think the measure, measure S thing has brought to the forefront um, a lot of the differences that have occurred because many of the, um, the Measure S people feel as though, um, maybe in a slightly more backhanded way, subtle way, that architects are part of the problem because they're actually in cahoots with the market, which is the developers who are making policy, which is running against their plans. And then actually if the city had only listened to the plans, they wouldn't have been so angry. Um, it's actually the lack. Of, it's actually the lack of willingness to um, of, of, of politicians to uh, to conform, you know, with the so-called proper plan <coughs> that has um, that has enraged people and has you know um, has led to this kind of crossroads. So I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit. Well, it's a really interesting point. Um, I mean, as the starting gambit in that discussion, it seems to me planners are 
much better able to articulate their relationship to publics and to development than we are. And I think that the assumptions that would, I mean, when I look at the towers that you see proliferating, I wish we were more connected to developers, right? I mean, it's not very good work that you see there. And in those towers, there's maybe two that any architect we've heard of has been associated with. So we get broadly painted uh, you know, as the criminals in this. But on the other hand, I think it's partly why we have to articulate a position that distinguishes our agency and values independent of development. Because if you look consistently, I mean, you know, we've long painted the developers as the enemy, and I think that's also not correct. But the power that they hold is vast. And that seems more clear than ever. And so we finding ways for us to establish where our own boundaries, possibilities, and actions lie in relationship to that is at least the starting point. It's not a very adequate response to the question, but I like the issue. I think some of the students should have some questions. Uh huh. Yeah, that's interesting. So this is the gallery that, pssst, that moved out at, under pressure from the anti-gentrification community movement. Um, yeah, really, uh, at our local level, I, I suppose gentrification is one of the thorniest problems we face right now politically. And again, I think this goes back to Roger's point. Architects are seen as part of the problem, as are the arts. Uh, and this is kind of a new formulation way in Los Angeles where you know arts district wasn't seen as anybody's enemy in particular before and now you know is really under fire. To me um, you know how we architects work with communities say in the case of gentrification uh, in, a, in a really literal way is extremely problematic now in places like Royal Heights. And when you look at the projects by Big and Herzog and Demeron that are happening there, whoa. I mean, that's going to get worse, not better, uh, in terms of the whole politics and our role therein. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that, but I've been thinking about it a lot. And I guess I would say that one of the things we can do is to slow that process down. I think that's the main job we have in gentrification at the moment is just to slow it down as, so that uh, people have a chance to negotiate possibilities. And so, you know, there are certain kinds of things you can do to slow gentrification. Affordable housing, ironically, being one of them. Uh, so there may be, in fact, programs and sites and politics that could actually uh, go hand in glove with other kinds of, you know, slow development goals. But I actually think that uh, that, that uh, stopping at the art gallery is a really interesting shift, frankly. I mean, it's not something you'd wish on any art gallerist, but it's a really important move to see what the city politics of development will become. Connected form, did you say? Participate. Uh -huh. Culturally, socially, etc. But within the scale that is political, mm -hmm. right? And some relevance. Um, you, you argue it, and I don't mean this in a pessimistic sense, but the fact that we are so totally tied up in the market system and it is moving in a particular direction that's been consistent. Solid. You're 
one social project in 40 years in Spain. Why? Because there are no social projects. <laughs> it's just, it's not, I'm going to invent a social policy, right? It requires um, a desire, which is going to be a complex political, cultural, Yeah, well, no, I, but I think, Tom, there'd be another way of looking at that, which would be to say that there's one definition of practice, which is kind of a, a generation <coughs> where that meant uh, opening up your own office, any of the sort of cliché, opening up your own office in the garage and then starting to build bigger and bigger buildings, right? Uh, I mean, there's a number of people in the audience that have done that, and it's pretty impressive. Um, but I don't think that's the only way people think about practice now, and I think if you look at our own junior colleagues, you'd see that. Not that they don't want to do buildings, but that they don't uh, make such a clear boundary around the way their uh, livelihood comes in. I mean, first of all, everyone in this faculty is also teaching, right? So we have a kind of freedom that we can exercise for different ends, either for you know, starting new projects or doing other kinds of practices. So I think partly I'm suggesting that the way we talk about practice has to be expanded to separate ourselves from the standard uh, relationship with a client that drives through fees to produce architecture. I mean, first of all, like, none of them owns the buildings anymore, so there's always in which neoliberal economies and new forms of uh, production of the physical environment have changed what we call practice. And I see a lot of what's going on, whether it's work in installations or exhibitions or conceptual projects, maybe it used to be competition projects, as being forms of that kind of critical practice, what we used to call critical practice, or what could be a form of agency. But uh, we kind of have to undo the ideas that what our, what drives our practice is a series of client-initiated programs. I don't think that's right for everybody, but I think that that's uh, one really important aspect of the profession that we could cultivate. It's interesting. It seems like I mean, you do that in your own practice. You want to radically shift the direction of the academic world. You might argue today only it couldn't be more or less relevant to your conversation. Couldn't be more or less relevant? To your conversation. Shaping, forming, as a preoccupation. Yeah, on the same hand, state, though, Tom, I think every application we read, and we just finished reading a bunch, comes in with dreams about uh, doing something important in the world. Like, I think in architecture, we we have a culture of people who want to make changes. And that, to me, that's not what happens in philosophy or history or, you know, they have other big goals. But our goals actually are ones that, you know, are, are about making change. So this is a little more complicated now than ever before, put it mildly. Um, so uh, maybe going back to one of the points that was made, we need to be thinking more radically <coughs> outside of how we imagine practice. Oh, and Andrew, because this is great. <laughs> but we, we're going to let people go pretty soon. But. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really great. Um, I'm curious about this relationship with, say, agency to the market. Uh -huh. um, and so you mentioned uh, Jameson. One of the examples that he writes about and talks about right here in L.A., the Bonaventure, mm -hmm. uh, by John Fortin, mm -hmm. and this being sort of totally disoriented. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, um, John Fortin developed that. Um, so I wonder kind of how you sort of think about that. Maybe like in between Philip Johnson and Donald Trump, there's kind of way or another way 
wow, uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. In other words, I mean, I think that's been a kind of fantasy model, which is we do it for ourselves, right? And that is one path through uh, a kind of agency. Um, there are interesting things going on about that at small scales now, right? I mean, there are practices around the city where young architects are also developers, like like parts of Venice and Santa Monica are all controlled by a single firm or two. Um, whether that's leading to alternative models, which is kind of what I'm interested in, is another matter. You know, I think that you know, if if the self-driven developer practices still aimed at just bigger and bigger profits, maybe that doesn't change much in the standard recipe. But um, you know, more interesting still might be the kinds of practices that are kind of cohering together around multidisciplinary, you know, not standard ways of responding to projects that um, can produce new kinds of results. I I'm really interested in trying to figure out where the kind of creative work is going on. <laughs> Well, I, to me, that's one direction that you could suggest going, which is like get inside the developer's head. Uh, I, I respect that. I, you know, I taught developers for about five years after fighting them, like tooth and nail for a while, thinking that maybe if I just like snuck in, I could figure it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and decided that was just really not the path for me, for sure. Um, didn't seem like they thought so either. But, uh, but you know, I, I guess what I want to be clear about is that I'm not. I don't want to. I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm not saying, yeah, go in and work inside development. I actually just think what we need to do is try to figure out where the cracks are in these different systems, and different places where different forms of practice can squeeze in. And it's a really like practical model in that regard. It's not a you know it's not a kind of zealotry that says well, this is the way the Pardon? Yeah, yes. And that the one you name is one of those. Do you think we should let people know? Do you think we should let people know? <laughs> All right. Yeah, Aubrey. Um, so Great. I really appreciate your uh, five points. They're very soothing. <laughs> soothing? Is yeah. that what you said? Good. Yeah. Yes, they have the kind of legibility that gives you the impression that you have to do something. Um, <laughs> and so when I like, take it a step further and I think about um, how those five points would actually live in the world, maybe, yeah. um, I think I inevitably imagine as in decisions that are being made by a single firm or a single, or you know, like five or six principles of a firm in talks with a developer. You know, the, the, the moments in which these decisions are made are, are you know, when it's upstream from the president of yet, are very closed. Um, they're <coughs> private. And then, on the other hand, um, we understand major forms of architectural discourse in media through images and through conceptual projects and through um, exhibitions and books and uh, lectures and whatnot. Those are very public forms of engagement where the language is decided in a very public, very 
those are the very pragmatic pushes to those decisions. And then on the flip side, I feel like a lot of these public forms of discourse are very generalized. And so I think maybe what I see in uh, those five points and maybe what um, we could work towards is, is maybe pragmatizing ethics or developing a language to talk about those private decisions. Because I feel like in, in studio when, when myself and others play out these scenarios of what we do, I think the most sophisticated question that we all, all always come up with is like, oh, do you just reject this mission? There's no sophistication. Right. Right. There's 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 no rigor to understand how these mechanics may work and they're only unconnected with nuances and a very exciting forms of theory that we engage with in the school and in the museum. And so I'm wondering if, um, I don't know, if, <coughs> is there any kind of hope in terms of like media? I mean, you referenced like architectural journalists and, and Blue Los Angeles still has Christopher Hawthorne, but um, is it social media? Is it, yeah. is it journalism? Is uh, like, how do we, how do we bridge this gap? Well, I, I like the characterization, or I, I'm interested in the characterization you make between the kind of private decisions that occur and then the sort of more public downstream uh, path that gets carved or trajectory that gets carved. Because it comes down to accountability, too. You know, like if those decisions are made on private, then the project is built. Sure, certainly there's, there's reflection on what the project can mean and how yeah. those decisions have been practiced. Well, I think that, I mean, you know, it's very hard to figure that out in school versus practice, in my experience. So, and it's partly why City Lab became a vehicle for me, so that we could actually do things, not simulate doing things. And actually, the part of studio, for instance, that's the doing of the thing, is actually the negotiation. There's interesting studies about that between you know the faculty and your fellow students and you in the project. I mean, it's all you're simulating a client relationship. But you have this other relationship by which decisions about design get made. And you can be recognizing your own ethics in those kinds of processes. And they're not typically decisions. I think that's the thing that's the other side of that. It's not like you think, OK, today I'm going to do the right thing. Now I'm going to add a little public space to this place. And tomorrow, I'll put the gate on it. But today, I'm going to do it right. Um, you know, it, it just never works like that. And it's a kind of, com I really think commitment is the right word of saying, you know, here's what I'm going to be. And, and that's why, in my mind, trying to figure out what your commitments might be over more than one project is the task. And that's for students or critics or uh, scholars or practitioners, in my mind. So you, you track your own, you know, trajectory, you know, your own progress through. And sometimes it's not available to express that commitment, and other times it is. So, you know, I think critics, uh, you know, I don't know, I, our architectural critics today are not, I think, helping us particularly, especially as architects. Um, you know, they've lost sight of what architecture has to do with the larger political agenda, and they've adopted much more uh, kind of remote social, you know, and that's coming from me as a social agenda. But I think, you know, when you look at, say, what Kimmelman does versus what Mushan did, we aren't getting a voice that's trying to help us work through what architecture's potential might be here. And so I really think it's incumbent upon critics to take that charge seriously and try to unearth those parts of projects that are designed with commitments, right? That commitments that stand for public interest, that stand for public sphere. I don't think that's so impossible. I, I you know, I realize we're working in a neoliberal system where we can make stuff outside of the, you know, economies and pressures that that exists in, but we still have uh, discourse, we still have debate, and we still have, you know, not just, I mean, I think that's the other thing I would, I've been trying to work through myself, is it's not just opposition and resistance. Because in architecture, that just doesn't work for us, right? I mean, that's not what our profession and discipline and projects are about. It's always about agency. 
So if we can't find paths of agency, you should go back and do your PhD in some other field, you know? I mean, really, I think that's the, you know, challenge for us is to, to figure out the architect's agency in that. Maybe one more. Going back to Andrew's question a little bit too, like, and, and it's not like you know Tom found in the '70s and it's a comment that there wasn't any money. We're in a very wealthy economy right now, like with Dow's and McDowell's and all the stuff. There are clients out there that have aligning principles. It's not just build the flash power or nothing. There's got to be something out there, right? Well, you know there. There are lots of kinds of, first of all, I, I think like developers and clients are also not homogenous entities that give us something to do so that they can make profit or get just what they want. I mean, it's not, it's not as simple as any of that. I think everybody in the room who's had projects and clients, whether they're, you know, all the forms of clients that we have, would be able to say there are plenty of times when we have clients that you're really negotiating something interesting with and that goes beyond what's uh, framed in terms of standard, say, economic and privatized relationships. And it's those projects where you want to get what you can from them, for instance. And those are the ones that we should be writing about. And those are the ones that we should be looking at as linked projects in the next projects that we do. And that if we get one of those, we maybe find ways to encourage other people to want that. And, you know, I think, I don't really think that it's the goal to have an entire practice like that, or to have a life of that. I don't think you have to be a zealot, but I think, you know, to find the means situations and to bring those into public discourse is the job. And those don't have to be built. You know, they can be they can be, they can take many forms. And they don't have to be permanent. <laughs> and they can you know, they can change. They, so and there are plenty of projects that are automatically in my mind in these categories, like affordable housing. I mean there there's not a public housing uh, Universe, but there are plenty of affordable housing nonprofits that we should be at the front of. We should be doing those projects more than, I mean, we should be using those projects as our best work. When I look at these projects of housing that are being assembled, you know, there's a new book by Michael, Michael, Kevin, Webb. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, it's like got a mixture of like the least expensive housing available and the most expensive housing available. You know, that the housing that costs the least is still in there in the pages with this housing that costs $50,000 a square meter. You know, it's pretty impressive to me. You know, I want to pull those projects out and say these are the ones that stand for something that our profession not just affordable housing. I mean, there's schools too. There are you know, lots of projects. Okay. Um, on that note. <laughs>